when our demographic numbers are nine, you know, pushing 19% of historically underrepresented peoples in this country, and yet we're still hovering around 3% in general across the board representation in all media. And I'm talking about, you know, kids' books, um, you know, all of the stuff that you and I um, are excited about, storytelling spaces. Uh, yeah, then what we're seeing is, um, you know, uh, such a huge discrepancy between demographics and um, those who are behind and in front of so-called cameras. Hello, and welcome to part two of a special two-part interview series about the status of diversity in Hollywood, or lack thereof. In the first part of this interview series, I spoke with Kristen Allen Stewart, filmmaker, educator, and founder of the Columbus Black International Film Festival about the 2022 UCLA Hollywood Diversity Report and the status of Black people, women, and the queer community in Hollywood. In part two of this interview series, I speak with Frederick Louise Aldama, university professor, author, and founder of SoulCon, the Brown and Black Comics Expo, among many other accomplishments. Professor Aldama and I also discuss the UCLA Hollywood Diversity Report, as well as the federal government's new Workforce Diversity Report that found that the Latinx community continues to be vastly underrepresented in media. I'll include links to these reports in the description box of these videos, as well as a link to a New York Times article the Professor Aldama brought to my attention that found that, unfortunately, but not surprisingly, Hollywood has somewhat regressed since the beginning of the Me Too movement in 2017 and the George Floyd social justice protests in the summer of 2020. I hope you find these conversations thought-provoking, and let me know what you think in the comments. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Aldama, for, uh, for agreeing to do this. I appreciate it. Yes, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to um, to get a sense from you as why is the Latinx community so underrepresented in media despite being the largest quote unquote minority group, especially the one report from the government said there was like almost zero growth in Latinx representation over the last decade in media. Yeah, I mean, you, I think you and I both know uh, why, and we'll get into that in just a second. Um, it is interesting to see, just do you know, to to do just a really quick look on the internet to see how people have been interpreting the the UCLA um, diversity report, Hollywood diversity report, and also the the um, the government report on uh, you know Latinos in the workforce um, and more generally diversity within the workforce in media, right? In radio, TV, broadcasting, streaming, news, news newspapers, film, et cetera. And it's becoming more and more obvious, Chris, that this is still um, the powers, the powers and the ones who are gatekeeping and the ones that are holding on tight to positions within these spaces are straight white dudes. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say, I say it's becoming more and more obvious is that when our demographic numbers are nine, you know, pushing 19% of historically underrepresented peoples in this country, and yet we're still hovering around 3% in general across the board representation in all media. And I'm talking about, you know, kids' books, um, you know, all of the stuff that you and I um, are excited about, storytelling spaces. Uh, yeah, then what we're seeing is, um, you know, uh, such a huge discrepancy between demographics and um, those who are behind and in front of so-called cameras. And I say so-called cameras because I'm talking here more generally about you know, storytelling spaces, whether you're writing the kids' books or in the newsrooms or in the writing rooms or in front of the cameras you know, as brown and black bodies and so on. So we're seeing 
that report, the diversity report that came out from UCLA, Hollywood, um, you know, there have been some advances, especially when it comes to gender and also some tiny little advances when it comes to black, um, you know, creatives, right? Mm -hmm. um, of course, <laughs> nothing like what we really, you know, expect or that this country should be allowing for and providing. So what it's actually telling us, Chris, is that not only is it at the top end that we're seeing people ho really holding tight to these spaces. And I'm talking about the majority and the report clearly shows it. The empirical evidence clearly sh um, shows it. It's not just you and I talking here, opinion, that it's an industry media, the media industry is still dominated by white men. Right. And, but also we need to think about deeper issues here. You and I both spend a lot of time in with outreach and you know, we need to think about the gatekeeping that already starts, you know, in preschool and kindergarten and K through 12 in general, and what it means for youth of color not to, first of all, given, be given access to all of the tools and concept building, knowledge making that allows for their full, um, you know, growth of their potentialities and wherever they want to go, but also the gatekeeping that deliberately pushes out and locks out, you know, youth of color in this country. And so, yeah, you know, we, there's, there's a system of gatekeeping and keeping and locking us out that begins the kind of the minute we're born into the world. Right. Do you think maybe there's a misconception among the public? You know, they see superstars like Jennifer Lopez and they see filmmakers like Robert Rodriguez, who's directed some, some blockbusters and they think, oh, well, there must be, you know, Latinx people must be doing perfectly fine if someone like J-Lo can be so su uh, successful and be, you know, be part of the mainstream. Do you think maybe the, the public doesn't realize that there's under, an, an underrepresentation problem? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Yeah. I mean, you get, you get the rep, you get the banner, the banner figures and the repetition of those figures in the mainstream limelight. And it's possible. Yeah. People think, oh yeah, well, what are they whining about? What are they complaining about? Um, but those you and I both know, I mean, we love Robert's films uh, J Lo's done some really cool stuff as well. I have to say, um, she's she's kind of opened new doors and pathways. Really exciting. Um, but they're only you know one person, and we want the full range and the full spectrum. It it goes back to the problem of if we are only given one or two or three. Not only are we hungry for um, all sorts of other kinds of ways that we are and the complex nuanced ways that we are in our communities. But where those one or two or three figures that are out in the kind of mainstream media limelight have to hold, they'll carry the weight of everything. So uh, Lin-Manuel, when In the Heights comes out, you know, I thought it was a, a beautiful kind of fairy tale. Um, that was grounded in kind of everyday reality. And it was, I thought, you know, there were some kind of areas that I thought it could have done better in, but a lot of our community pushed back against it because there wasn't enough Afro-Latinx representation. Well, uh, yeah, we can do better. Lin-Manuel can certainly do better. And John Chu, uh, the director, could have had a casting agent sort of in charge that was much more aware of that but we wouldn't be having that conversation if we had you know in one given year i don't know the release of five big tent blockbuster movies uh, a, across a, a range of genres with all sorts of different stories and different kinds of uh, folks in front of the camera and folks in the writing room we wouldn't be having that conversation because there wouldn't be the burden of the one carrying the, the, the weight of all representation. Right. Do you think maybe one point of progress is that 
quote unquote brown face casting is not acceptable anymore. Like I remember in the 90s, there was a movie called The Perez Family and it had Angelica Houston, um, Marissa Tomei and no, no, no one, you know, who was Latinx in it. And there, there was like sort of a mild uproar about it, but not, you know, not, not the kind of uproar that you would get in 2022 if a movie like that came out and it had absolutely no Latino actors. Do you think that's maybe a, a little bit of progress that, in, like, for example, if the musical Evita was done today, would it be acceptable to have a, a white pop star playing the main role or would there be a demand for a Latina to be in the main role, in the lead role? No, I think there we've definitely made some advances, but Chris, you also have to think about now today, um, you know, what does color conscious casting actually mean and look like? So color conscious casting is, you know, uh, we put a Latino Latina in front of the camera and we've checked the box. Yeah. And we don't think about who's in the writing room actually, um, you know, drawing out that character, filling that character with life. Mm -hmm. And so we get, we might get phenotypic representation. We might get body, a kind of bodily representation and even maybe an accent language representation. But do we get the anchor in cultural context, the anchor in the kind of greater sophistication and nuance of backstory that would allow us to see kind of the complex spectrum of the ways our experiences and our experiential identities are shaped and um, kind of transformative in this country? Mm, not all the time. So I, I ask, you know, the question, is this any different to brown face? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. And I know I've kind of touched on this point when we spoke of before, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but I think it's sort of an, you know, a sticking point. Is the um, issue of Latinx representation complicated by the fact that some Latinx people consider themselves a white ethnic group? So if, you know, mm -hmm. if a producer, if a head of a movie studio is saying, okay, if Latinos are just a white ethnic group like Italians, and if Hector Elizondo can play an Italian, why can't an Italian play a you know, Puerto Rican. Do mm -hmm. you think that's sort of a, an issue that complicates the issue, the, uh, the whole issue of representation? You know, I can't, I don't know, like, I can't speculate on what goes on in, you know, producer rooms and, you know, writer rooms, um, you know, elevator pitches. Yeah. But certainly we can say this, that whatever excuse can be made will be made if there is someone in the room that doesn't understand and either out of ignorance or out of willful um and i'm just gonna say it, kind of racism you know so yeah they're gonna pull out whatever they're gonna pull out um to justify their own positions you know one one way to change all of that is to actually look a little harder and it doesn't take much work to bring in all of the different kind of ways that we are uh you know latinos in this country we are a huge phenotypic variation we have even though we share there are sort of shared commonalities um we are dark, light, we're Afro-Latinx, we are, Af you know, Chicanx, Mexican, uh, um, Black, uh, you know, all of the things that we share in, in this a kind of colonial and, co you know, as a colonized people, we're indigenous, mestizo. So until we start to get some of that range and that spectrum, you know, people are going to pull out that whatever, whatever card they need to justify their, their continued gatekeeping practices. Right, right. I you guess know, the crazy, the crazy thing is from those, this report, um, the diversity report is that, you know, and this is, we know this, but we have empirical evidence now to, to, to bolster this position, which is that, Latinos are the ones that basically um, made kind of 
buoyed the industry, the media industry through the pandemic. Right. You know, it was us and our families and our families and fam bigger, you know, even bigger families going to the movies. And that was the case before the pandemic. It's the case now. We are the demographic that is most excited and interested in, you know, a big tent cinema. Um, and yet we are still um, very, very underrepresented, as you already mentioned, when it comes to directors, writers, casting, leads, uh, et cetera. So, you know, what can we call it? I think at this point we can actually call it for what it is, which is not just shameful, but there is a lot of racist practice that, you know, continues to function at the heart of the industrial media complex. Right. I guess the last question I had was what opportunities are there for Latinx people and African Americans and Asians and every other group that's underrepresented um, to work together to, I guess, make representation more equal across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, have to kind of um, see, see what is going on and support, you know, unions within industry that are also very color conscious, not color blind. And, you know, we also need to support and participate in all of our media watchdog entities that have been grown from the ground up, you know, these grassroots, you know, watchdog entities. And whenever they call something out, you know, you know, support those initiatives. Um, but even more practically, we need to continue to do the work to clear spaces for our young people to see that this even in spite of the obstacles that there's support for them to make their way into in front of the camera behind the camera the writing room spaces um, sometimes that means in and through um, forms of kind of writing and creating like you know fiction alphabetic fiction comic book making um, you know, introduce, you know, through our networks um, to directors that are, you know, activists as well, like Alex Rivera, uh, who's a MacArthur Genius Award winner and his partner, Christina. Um, people like Peter Morietta over there at Arizona State University, all of whom are actively trying to make a difference by opening new spaces, by by mentoring um, Ben Lopez, who was um, over there with Nalit for a long time. You know, they all have programs that are actively recruiting and training. Um, Gigi Sal Guerrero, America Ferreira, all of these people that have platforms and have, in, you know, um, a certain degree of influence and power. Um, are making a difference. So yeah, that's what we need to do. We also need to, we need to collaborate with our activists, media activists within disability spaces, LGBTQ spaces, um, GLAD, you know, all of these things, because if we, tr we are, as you know, uh, more powerful if we work together than if we try to do things separately. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Professor Aldama. I really appreciate it. Anytime. If you like these videos and you would like more content like this, please consider becoming a member on Patreon. Link in the description box.